Joining us now on the 966, a familiar face from the scorching hot desert-like conditions of London, where temps today are forecast to soar as high as 40 degrees Celsius, Colonel David Day Roche. David is a professor at the National Defense University, a security expert, and he graciously agreed to join us on the 966 once again today to talk about President Biden's recent visit to the region and more. Welcome back, Colonel. We've got the AC pumping here at the 966 Virtual Magilis. Great to see you again. We're really comfortable. It's, it's, it, it's it's really an honor, and uh, you know, you guys go ahead and bust my chops because yeah, <laughs> the weather here is miserable. <laughs> we need to come up with another level, Dave. I think I think plutonium level might be for you know for for you know, <laughs> featured guest and honored guest. No, uh, again, really, thanks for joining, joining us, Dave. And uh, you're in UK, you're in London, mm-hmm. and you're there for uh, meetings, but also you're there for the Gulf Research Center confab. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, I guess you were workshop director for challenges of change and transformation in the Gulf during COVID time, social, economic, and political dimensions. Uh, well, what that, great research you've done. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. well unbeknownst to you, I track your every move because I'm a fanboy. <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> you you no. should be frightened, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, how'd the meeting go? What, what's the, you know, it's an interesting time to be there amongst a lot of your peers. Yeah. And, and, people who analysts and and people who have something to offer to the, to the analysis and this sort of thing. Yeah. Good question. So um, yeah, obviously the Gulf research meeting was held right as president Biden was visiting the Gulf. So um, there was a lot of discussion of that, but the thing about the Gulf research center is that the the meetings are interdisciplinary. So uh, not everybody's focused on politics and almost nobody is focused on security. I think, the only security related papers were presented in other workshops and they dealt with things like great power competition or Chinese military influence in the Indian Ocean. So um, uh, it was mostly informal discussion rather than presentations of papers on what's going on. There's still in the academic and I think the foreign policy community a widespread belief that um, the United States has uh, abandoned the Middle East. Um, I've, been, I've been hearing this since 2010. Uh, uh, and it is persistent. It is widespread. It is utterly resistant to evidence or uh, any sort of fact based. Uh, it, it's just a very, very um, pervasive uh, uh, feeling in there. Um, the Saudis, um, my Saudi friends were uh, triumphant. Um, they were like, Baha, we're back. And um, most of my friends who um, uh, watch the Gulf but are have a degree of detachment we're kind of puzzled uh to be honest like why are we doing this why now well let's 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 look at the trip and because you 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 have insights on all steps of it uh you know he went to israel president biden went to israel visited palestine then on to Jeddah, which was a two-part visit in Jeddah. the the one was Mm -hmm. the with security defense uh conference with the region in essence and then one was a bilateral with with uh saudi arabia Right. Um, one of the things in the run up, and we talked a lot about it on 966, was sort of the noise and everybody trying to get their their bid in for what should happen. And one of these, of course, one of the leading plays was was, you know, Israeli interest saying, you know, well, let's push normalization. And mm-hmm. by the way, we have you know, we we can do a Middle East air defense umbrella. Um, mm-hmm. You talked a little bit about this in uh, in a piece in Politico. Uh, yes. What, and, and I, I can quote you back to you, but I bet you could have a th- some thoughts on this without, uh, you know, in terms of the, the actual, the, the, the chances for something like this, the actual pragmatic yeah. mechanics of trying to do something like this. Yeah. So when, when you say Middle East Air Defense Net, what we're really talking about is something like the British, Canadians, and American defense of Britain in World War II, where you had interchangeable um, command structures, uh, sensors, firers that would all feed into a common net and a common command system, which operating manually for the most part, but with determined priorities. And so they'd say, all right, there's a target coming here. I'm the overall commander. The Canadian gun battery here will fire and the American gun battery will fire to protect a British asset. Um, now, a lot of that is automated, but we're still far away from it. Paradoxically, because of automation, it's actually harder to achieve that vision because each of the Gulf states has bought a different command and control system. So it's like, you know, if you're old enough to remember video recorders, you know, 
one guy's got Betamax, one guy's got VHS, oh, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and uh, so, so you have a, a technological challenge because these countries have all bought different systems and then they bought different sensors and shooters. So, um, you know, um, the Bahrainis have uh, Crotel. Uh, and the Saudis have Crotel, which is a French system. And when you're trying to integrate that gun system into, or missile system into an integrated air defense radar for the software compatible, you get to this issue where, you know, the French manufacturer will say, okay, give us the American source code and adapt to it. And the Americans say, no, 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 you give us your source code. <laughs> um, and and it, it's just, it's just very hard just from a trade technology, information security uh, preservation of national sovereignty standpoint, referring to the suppliers, not necessarily the Middle East countries. Right. Then the next issue you have is, <laughs> even if you're doing this World War II with you know, a grease pencil on a piece of glass, in order to have a truly effective air defense system, you have to open the kimono. And uh, you have to say, okay, these are the things we're going to defend in priority, boom, 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 boom. Which means you're also saying, these are the things we're not defending. Well, when you have countries that, you know, are not at the same level of peace that say Belgium and the Netherlands are, you know, that's a vulnerability. So for the Israelis to get involved there, you know, they would have to say, okay, we're protecting this, 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 and this, and telling the Arab states, we're not protecting this, this, and this. And, you know, even with the best of intentions, there's still the problem of compromise, you know, through espionage or technological leak. So I don't think we're anywhere near close to that NATO vision of an integrated air defense system. What we are close to is something we'd call an integrated air defense system. And it would basically be a forum, uh, which could be in real time, uh, where people exchange information on threats, best practices, because the threat is all the same. It's all Iranian. Uh, best practices and then conduct periodic exercises. Um, on the, again, one, another issue that came up and, and, and again was put forward as promising was, I guess, in early 2021, Israel was moved from uh, the jurisdiction of the uh, U.S. European Command to the U.S. Central Command. Yeah. So now they're in a pool with uh, our Arab allies. And, and again, I'm trying to read the enthusiasm for these sorts of things. How meaningful is something like that? <clears throat> Uh, well, it, it can be overstated. I mean, people forget, but in 2000, Syria and Lebanon were in European command as well. Um, the idea was, Interesting. That, yeah, yeah. The idea was how are we going to project power, uh, you know, into these countries and along the Mediterranean littoral, they said, well, we'll probably do it by sea. So let's have all the seafront um, owned by European command. So you don't have an artificial change of command when a ship goes across an invisible line in the ocean. Um, the Abraham Accords obviously helped pave the way for that. I think that there had to be some sort of uh, implicit recognition from other Arab countries that were not ready to routinize relations with Israel that, um, you know, there's a lot of peacetime engagement in a combatant command, and it's not all um, hardcore shooters and intel. You know, there's a uh, Central Command has, a, or Southern Command, I used to work uh, a uh, conference of lawyers, you know, like military lawyers of all the different countries would get together. And, and uh, I've done this for uh, Central Command with doctors, uh, you know, military surgeons. So they have a conference of military surgeons. And the, the issue in the past had been that if Israel were to attend, the other countries would say, okay, we're not going to attend. Um, with the Abraham Accords, you know, you, Egypt was always willing to do it. Jordan, became willing to do it. The Abraham Accords, you had more countries and there seemed to be this recognition that, yeah, you know, they will attend. Uh, there won't be a boycott. So that's not a formal policy shift, but uh, the powers that be at the Joint Staff and the National Command Authority have decided that, yeah, they're ready for that. So, so the other interesting thing about um, moving Israel is that a lot of U.S. security assistance is administered and directed. It's the day-to-day -day management at the combatant command level. And foreign military funding, Israel's the largest recipient of it. The next two largest recipients of it are Jordan and Egypt. So you had sort of a bureaucratic anomaly where um, most of European command was dealing with peer countries or with threat countries and no foreign military funding at all, except for Israel, which was a huge cell doing a weird mission that nobody else in European command did. And then over at Central Command, 
you have a lot of people dealing with Egypt, dealing with Jordan, dealing with other countries like Bahrain that receive foreign military funding, quite a few of them, um, that, you know, Israel could slot into that relatively easily. So bureaucratically, it kind of makes sense. So there was a political imperative, there uh, an international political imperative, which was that the Arab states seemed to be more accepting of Israel. There was a domestic imperative, which was seeking to uh, bureaucratically solidify the Abraham Accords so that a new administration couldn't come and undo it. And then there was also a bureaucratic imperative, which is, you know, you want to have like bureaucratic functions uh, consolidated in organizations that deal with it for ease of efficiency. That's a fascinating nugget on, on you talking about uh, medical and lawyers. You know, these are the deep sort of institutional things that continue, that are never get on the front page. They're all back page stuff, but yeah. are, are meaningful. Um, I'm going to, I want to keep you on the security mm -hmm. track and you, I know you're sure. more than that because uh, we'll, we'll move out some. Uh, I'm, I'm also a great dancer. Hey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is it any wonder I stalk you? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, one of the, you know, in, in the readout, uh, uh, there's some new stuff. There was some stuff that's been in, in process or stuff that really is, you know, just, mm -hmm. you know, putting another, another item in there. Uh, but uh, it did talk, the White House readout did talk about the, the, the combined task force 153, which was mm -hmm. recently established. And this is, this mm -hmm. is, well, there's, can you tell us about, so there's a combined task force 153, which deals mostly with, with the Red Sea and then uh, combined task force 150, which is the Gulf of Oman, Northern North Arabian Sea. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the, what are these and how meaningful are they? There's also 151, which is in the Gulf. So right. they are meaningful. They're multinational. Um, you know, they all have um, similar missions with, with geographic differences and differences in focus. So the real significance of standing up a multinational naval task force in the, in the Red Sea is that Israel is a riparian state in the Red Sea. So this is a follow on to the normalization with Israel. Um, obviously, Egypt uh, is a member, obviously, Sudan. Uh, you know, assess the Abraham Accords. So that's uh, right. the west side of the Red Sea covered <laughs> down to the Horn of Africa. And then you've, um, uh, Saudi Arabia is not, but uh, you have, uh, Jordan is, of course, Saudi Arabia is not, but you have the revitalized Houthi threat and the threat to shipping in the Babu Mandeb. Uh, and then I think there was just sort of, um, bureaucrats around the world who had even a marginal responsibility for the Suez Canal when the uh, ship was lodged in the canal and disrupted everything for weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I think people got a, got a crash course in geopolitics. And, uh, you know, this idea of choke points became a, a, a less academic and more of a practical thing. And so I think that there was a, a universally shared bureaucratic imperative to have more say more command and control over what was happening at the top and the bottom of the red sea and the fact that one of the big um stumbling blocks which was you know prior to recent years most riparian states of the red sea would say that their main purpose is to oppose israel in the red sea that that has kind of gone by the wayside uh, now you're looking at Houthi threats against shipping, and there have been attacks against merchant ships from the Houthis in Yemen, as well as the potential damage at the north end of the Gulf of the Canal. So it's it's a natural evolution, I would say, of a continual mission. So is it, Israel's not a, is Israel involved in the combined task force 153, or is it just that they have riparian that that that, that task force deals with Israeli riparian rights? Well, it it affects Israeli riparian rights. So. You, you, you caught me at a disadvantage. I should have looked that up before we started. I'm not well, no, I, 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 I do I not believe there are, I, I don't believe they're a formal member of the task force, but they have sent um, a liaison to NAV sent headquarters. So they have a presence right. at the headquarters that provides command and control and they do take part in specific exercises. So there was a naval exercise that was conducted in the Red Sea that was Israel was a part of it. It was a very right. low level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, no, no, I, I don't think they are either. But I just, I just, this thing is curious, and I think it's, you know, it's part of what's going on, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's worthwhile and, and ultimately uh, beneficial. These sort of sub rosa opportunities to, to, to be in the same place at the same time in a cooperative manner. 
uh, yeah. you know, and, and the resolution of the islands to run in Santa Fe, are, you know, uh, again, you know, people dismiss it, you know, Israel, Israel, you know, agreed to it in 2017. It's just pro forma. It is, but it's better than what was gone before. And, yeah. and, and so many other things, these are small baby steps. Well, I, I did a lot of work on Tehran and Santa Fe Islands. I was once the commander of the islands uh, in the multinational peacekeeping forces. <laughs> this is, this is and, awesome. uh, where in the cool. world is where in the world is Dave? That's what we do this week. <laughs> well, I actually uh, my real name is Waldo. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 you might have met my wife Carmen San Diego. Uh, <laughs> so so um, yeah, I, it's just too hot for me to wear my. <laughs> red and white knit cap today. Um, <laughs> and we couldn't uh, see you anyway in the, in the, in the, <laughs> yeah that's right you'd never find me yeah. yeah exactly so 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 the um and i did a lot of research in graduate school on this so so egyptians will tell me you don't know anything this is this is a point where as just as sart wrote about how the most um uh internationally bien pesant frenchman uh the moment he sets foot in algeria he becomes you know a pied noir and this is france and it's irrevocable the egyptians are the same about the two islands they're like you know, it's just sacred territory it's sovereign um my assessment based on my <laughs> academic study is that the islands always have been saudi and but Saudi was unable to project any sort of meaningful power there. And the right. Camp David Accords were impossible unless Saudi sort of relinquished some sovereignty to the Egyptians so that, you know, Israel would have uh, access through the Straits of Aqaba to the to the Red Sea. And so the Egyptian National Police um, provided security there. But at the time, we viewed it as sort of a contract thing because it was just there was no usable port. Uh, right. you know, within easy distance for Saudi Arabia. And so they, we viewed it as sort of subcontracting. We actually have a, an arrangement like that on the um, west coast of the United States on the border between Seattle and Vancouver, because the line was drawn in London. There's a U.S. peninsula called Point Roberts that uh, you have the United States, you have the Canadian border and the inlet, and then you have a little isolated peninsula of Camp Roberts that is geographically disconnected from United States and the border patrol with weapons has to cross the Canadian border, transit Canada, and then go down into Point Roberts in order to exercise U.S. sovereignty there. So it's 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 rare. It's rare, but it's not unknown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like Kaliningrad, but uh... well, Kaliningrad is a colony. Full stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, so let's move back on on the trip. Sure. So, sure. uh, uh, you know, uh, President Biden comes, you know, the, you know, as I was talking with, we were talking yesterday, you know, the signal to noise ratio on this trip was was not conducive to actual signal. It was a lot of yeah. noise. Yeah. Um, but, but he comes to, to Saudi Arabia and everybody has an interpretation. What's yours? Uh, well, uh, I think it's telling that I think the most influential, most read quoted article uh, on in the advance of the trip was the Washington Post one basically saying, why is he going and who convinced him to go? And it, you know, it was Brett McGurk, Jake Sullivan. So the question is why uh, the president is clearly irritating his base. Uh, you know, it, it's seen as hushing up the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, the Saudis uh, were very quick to triumph it as a return to normalcy as um, you know, okay, all that's behind us. Let's move forward. Uh, and there were no real concrete, commitments there. Um, I was expecting, uh, I thought it was more probable than not, we'd have the um, announcement of about six to $10 billion worth of additional arms sales, the so-called defensive weapons, which is a <laughs> relatively meaningless term to me. Air but, quotes, defensive weapons, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, air defense systems, which, you know, are arguably the most defensive of any kind of defensive weapon system, if that thing exists, which I would say it doesn't. Um, but there was a lot of complications domestically. So first off, you have the president who is doing power politics uh, over, you know, and setting aside what he announced in the campaign was his guiding principle. He's moving out on that because interests of state demand it. So that is uh, understandable. It's noble even because he's going to take significant damage. Uh, I think that the domestic situation in the United States, where you had the Supreme Court abortion decision, um, where you have the January 6th committee, probably 
paradoxically embolden the president. You know, he can turn to his base and say, I have to do this. I'm president. This is what I need to, to accomplish as president. You going to vote for the other guys? I don't think so. You know, it's <laughs> like, you're with me. You know, yeah. the, the ships have been burned. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I think also there was a, a bill introduced in Congress um, uh, to restrict weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. And I mm-hmm. think that that domestic act is probably, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I'm thinking that it, it, that is probably not unconnected with the fact that there wasn't an announcement of a weapon sale uh, made. Uh, and I think that once that bill is disposed of, um, that there will be an announcement of, um, you know, a, a significant recapitalization, uh, an enhancement and a replenishment of Saudi air defense stocks at a minimum. Um, so, uh, but we didn't see that. And the other thing, paradoxically, is we didn't see um, a concrete commitment to provide a certain amount of oil um, to the field. Again, I think this is more of a statesman-like thing because uh, from a security standpoint, what's not needed is oil. It's natural gas, which- Correct. And Saudi Arabia, capacity, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah or, or the ability for Europe yeah. And we're really talking about Europe. Europe doesn't have the ability to receive natural gas uh, in the quantities yeah. it needs. Yeah. So, so you know, it's not sh- so much sure what could be done. Uh, and really, this oil thing is more about the domestic price of gas, which um, is is not a winner <laughs> for the Biden administration. <laughs> so it's hard to see what they were doing. Um, and honestly, you know, prior to him setting out from Israel, there were reports that, you know, he was going to be greeted by... I think deputy governor of Mecca province. And uh, I can tell you, given the amount of political risk he was running, it, had I been advising him, I would have said, oh, Mr. President, you're breathing heavily, you're sweating. I don't think you can go on. <laughs> you know, I don't think you can go on this trip. <laughs> that, that, that's what I would have done. Well, um, so I, I, sorry to interrupt that. No, um, that's all right. I, I think it's telling that you know, when asked about that that topic, your your uh, initial analysis and, and, and perfectly appropriate is an assessment of domestic politics. Yeah. So, yeah. is it possible that he you know he's going there uh, because he sees it in the U.S. national interest? Absolutely, absolutely. And what, the, part, um, what part of that did that play? You know, because go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're exactly right. Look, um, all the people who work national security are like, okay, there have been problems. Uh, You know, there's a prominent uh, dissident journalist who's been murdered, we think, at the order of the state. But, you know, Francois Mitterrand in the 80s ordered the destruction of the Rainbow Warrior in New Zealand. And, you know, French naval officers killed a man in New Zealand Harbor. And then France lied in order to ensure that their naval officers were repatriated from New Zealand. And they said, yeah, we'll hold them in incarceration. And they were treated as national heroes once they got back to France. We did not break relations with France. We did not expect Wait, wait a second. NATO. Wait a second. You mean there's no. not a Saudi exception? You mean other people in the world have done these sorts of nasty things? Um, well, not, not <laughs> no recently. <way. laughs> not, recent, not recently and not to a columnist for the Washington Post and not in such a grisly manner. Um, you know, I mean. I mean and, and I don't I don't want to make light yeah, of it, but yeah, this is something yeah. I've talked about is, if, if yeah. it, you know, it, it, as, as, as nasty as this was, if this is the benchmark where, you know, we shouldn't be engaging with Vladimir Putin, uh, G, you know, God knows we're not shouldn't be meeting with uh, with the, the head of North Korea. Uh, same with Turkey and same with Israel. Some would say Israel. Yeah. Well, you know, so there are there are priorities of engagement. Uh, there's an engagement with rivals. There's an engagement with uh, partners, which is more transactional. And there's an engagement with allies, which is more critical. And, um, uh, you know, I think what we saw here for a while was um, people thought that the relationship with Saudi Arabia and the United States was more of a relationship of allies. And, um, you know, when you when you deal at the coal face in these things, almost every partner in the United States says, we want a more transactional relationship. <laughs> and then when the United States demands something from them or scales back its commitment because of something seen as unrelated to the issue at hand, um, narcotics trafficking sanctions, human rights sanctions, fiscal sanctions, um, Almost always in the bureaucracy, some American action officer will say they wanted a transactional relationship. They got it. I've, I've heard that hundreds of times in the course of my career. Um, with Saudi Arabia, 
neither country can afford for that relationship to be transactional. Um, we are like-minded countries in the security realm. We are different-minded countries in terms of governance. Um, and, you know, for decades, the paradox has been, you know, regardless of who the president is, the policy has been they're security partners, we're facing a common threat, they're vital economic partners, we will engage with them on that, and we will urge reform. And the reform has not been seen to come. And so President Biden, uh, as a candidate, said, you know, I'm going to put reform at the top of the agenda. Uh, I can guarantee you that almost everybody in the bureaucracy who does not have the word human rights in their official title um, uh, have, have been trying to walk him back from day one. Yeah. And uh, this kind of represents the the triumph of the national security infrastructure, which hostile people will call the blob. But um, speaking as a realist, uh, with a capital R in the Ken right. Waltz sense, I think it recognizes American natural interests, um, national interests. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this various uh, discussion yesterday with a group of Saudi practitioners and and there was, mm -hmm. the, the term reset was used and somebody took an exception that said, look, you know, we don't want to reset because that that uh, implies a return to the, to, to the relationship before. Um, mm -hmm. Is there is this an opportunity to, uh, as we've often said on, on this show, update, recalibrate, redirect the relationship that, to reflect a, 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 a new Saudi reality, a new regional reality? I mean, I mean, and you've spoken about this. You know, there's a there's a flowering of diplomacy in the region over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's Saudi in many ways is the center pivot of this uh, in terms of de-escalating, de-conflicting, getting more in tune. You know, there was a lot of consulting and consultation in the run up to this meeting with President Biden, yeah. which is all good. <clears throat> you know, let's get on the same page, guys, because we're, we're threatened by the same thing. Uh, and, and I, you know, this is a good thing, I think, from the U.S. perspective that these regional mm -hmm. regional states are tending to their own business a little more, uh, a little less confrontationally. Right. Right. Um, so uh, when you say reset, I'm not sure if that means like a factory reset or, uh, uh, well, uh, or well, I think, I, I think in a, in a, in a, you know, I, I think, I think his point was, all right, you know, it's not, we need to move. If we're going to be, if this is going to be effective and sustainable and attractive mm -hmm. to our partners, yeah. it needs to be more, than a discussion of just security and oil. Yeah, no, I, I think that's the case. I mean, one of the unheeded lessons of the Afghanistan withdrawal, which was a disaster, which greatly concerned everybody in the region. Uh, one of the unheeded lessons, and I, I tell this to my Saudi friends, and I, I actually tell this to even my English friends, you know, my Canadian friends, is um, if the United States is involved as a security partner and there's significant uh, you know, contribution, you know, if, if, if American soldiers are dying, uh, eventually there will be an informal referendum on the morality of your country. If we're supporting your country with our lives, eventually we are going to hold an informal referendum. And uh, so, you know, the, the picture in Americans' minds when we were leaving Vietnam was the uh, chief of police of, of uh, Saigon executing the guy with the pistol shot to the head. And, uh, you know, the, the corruption and feebleness and the entrenched warlordism, which was contrary to the central government in Afghanistan, that became the dominant image in the United States. And people eventually said, no, this is just isn't worth it. So uh, I make that point with my Saudi friends and with, with my other allied friends to let them know that it is a false idea to view that there is a world of security and a world of human rights and democratization and that near, near the twain shall meet. It is... The membrane has been somewhat impermeable during the Cold War, but that membrane is becoming more and more permeable every day. And um, democratization, respect for human rights is a security issue if you want to work with any Western democracy. At the end of the day, it becomes a security issue. And this, the Cold War idea, you know, where somebody like Mobutu can uh, run rampant as long as he remains allied with the right people, those days are over. So are you saying that this, this uh, supposed or apparent, you know, turn from, from, uh, for Biden, to, uh, from idealism to realism vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and the region uh, is, uh, is only goes so far because. Yeah, I'd say it's a, it's a tack, not a turn. And I would say that um, a lot of the Saudis are being kind of triumphal. Um, 
uh, Adela Jaber, who is probably, well, he is the most effective uh, diplomat the Saudis have had since Prince Bandar. Um, you know, he said, oh, I never heard him mention that. <laughs> you know, this man was King Abdullah's personal translator. Okay. He does not say things, uh, you know, off the cuff. With he is reflecting the interests of the Saudi government. For people to say, okay, that's it. The chapter's behind us. Let's move forward as if there, this were 1989, Desert Storm. That's a mistake for my friends in the Gulf. Um, they, they seem to recognize this not as a concession from President Biden, as a hand, they see it as a capitulation. And man, don't spike the ball in the end zone because you're going to get a reaction you don't want. Interesting. Or don't you know, don't spike the ball at the five yard line. Uh, yeah. There you <laughs> um, go. Well, well you know, <laughs> the, 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 uh, I, that was ugly. And that is ugly. It's unfortunate. You know, it, you know, yep. it would have been nice if they'd have come out of this and said, guys, zip it on any kind of interpretation, commentary, commentary, mm-hmm. anything, because you, yeah, unbelievable. I, I, I'm with you, you know, parsing what, you know, I'm quite confident out of Lodge Bear is speaking the truth because that's, it's what he does and what he heard and what he saw. And especially the way he phrased it. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, it was really should have been left alone. And anyway, the, 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 the he said, she said, I think is minor stuff, but it's unfortunate. And, and we'll, I, I trust we'll get past it. Um, inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Um, uh, no, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I feel fortunate, Dave, that, you know, you're there in the UK speaking with a lot of colleagues. And obviously you bring a tremendous amount of uh, institutional historical uh, insight to this. Um, I, I thought it was a... Um, it's interesting. Uh, and, you know, Joe Biden said at the beginning before he went, I'm going to quote, said, the reason that I'm going to Saudi Arabia is we have an opportunity to reassert what I think we've made a mistake of walking away from our influence in the Middle East, unquote. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not really too concerned with deliverables. Um, mm-hmm. I think there were some significant and meaningful deliverables, and I've referred to them as singles, you know, no doubles, yeah. no home runs, but singles, mm-hmm. meaningful, mm-hmm. meaningful. But I just, I just felt that, um, you know, the void that has existed for 18 months plus has, uh, uh, you know, been filled by uh, wild speculation and, and uh, adversaries, so even adversaries, of course, you know, you know yeah. no, nobody loves a void like Russia. And of yeah. course, China, China is the real deal. So, so mm-hmm. our absence, and especially the trickliness and the, and the you know, distance between uh, Mohammed bin Salman, King Salman, and, and, and our leadership is problematic. So in that sense, getting past this, this pissing match that's been mm-hmm. ongoing, to me, is a significant step in the right direction for our national interest. Yeah. Um, all the details aside, and it can be parsed and criticized and that sort of thing, but that's my take. No, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, look, you know, we have an important country that's an important economic power that is like minded on issues of security, but is an absolute monarchy. Um, so, you know, there's going to have to be some compromises in dealing with that. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of uh, Churchill uh, when uh, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union and he announced we're going to partner with them. And he said, well, you know, if, if Hitler invaded hell, I would be expected to at least mention the devil favorably. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not at that level no. we're not at that level with saudi arabia i mean there, there's a lot of commonality there and people forget you know there's also a lot of um uh indulgence the relationship is strong uh at a interpersonal and a bureaucratic level so mm-hmm. that things that might have led to a rupture like the pensacola shooting which was you know a vetted Saudi right. military officer, right. uh, you know, who was, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the report of that is instructive reading. Um, there are lessons there for the United States. There are also lessons for Saudi Arabia. But the fact remains that the United States still trains an amazingly high number of Saudi military officers. Um, you know, we're seeing genuine reform in the Saudi government that I thought was unthinkable five years ago. Uh, women driving is significant, but it's more significant than women driving. It's a easing up of the guardianship laws, which I think will not be around for much longer. Um, mm-hmm. We're seeing um, uh, the a fundamental reform of the Saudi defense infrastructure, moving towards a joint model. Uh, we're seeing the introduction of critical thinking into the Saudi military curricula. Um, we're seeing an openness to um, people who are critical 
um, uh, in a friendly, helpful way, like me. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's really, I mean, the winds of change are still blowing. And uh, I hope that the, the things that have set us back, you know, I, I, I think that even a Saudi, even the most hawkish Saudi is hard pressed to <clears> defend <throat> the path of the war in Yemen, which is the second major irritant with the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the Jamal Khashoggi murder was um, horrible. Uh, and honestly, I don't see how that can be made right. But uh, President Biden has reconciled himself with it. So eventually, I think the rest of the government will as well. Yeah, I agree with you. And, I, and I, I always think it's I always appreciate it when really people who are uh, really deep into the relationship point out these Institutional relationships, which I refer mm -hmm. to in various, you know, the sinews of the relationship. This is sort of what yeah. holds it together and what sustains it, which is one reason why I like it, part of this, you know, the readout was that, you know, we're going to we're going to be working with the Saudis now on, uh, on mm -hmm. cooperation on 5G and 6G. Yeah. Uh, discussion on energy security, discussion on clean energy, um, you know, cybersecurity, space exploration, public health cooperation, you know, the sinews, you know, right. at the at the working right. level uh, that that generate and sustain really close relationships and goodwill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at the potential for economic transformation, um, you know, every barrel of oil should be converted into chemical feedstock <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and should be ultimately converted into, you know, under armor polo shirts that are sold at a very high premium you know, with, with new, you know, that's, that's the most cost efficient. Yeah. thing so how do you um provide energy in an extremely hostile environment that i think is almost as hot as london is today <laughs> almost, um, yeah. and, and you know <laughs> yeah so so you know green energy renewable energy um some sort of regional intercooperation on natural gas which should be the um primarily non-renewable energy source for Saudi Arabia, and it is not at the moment, uh, nuclear. There's a whole range of uh, things there, which the United States, you know, is a valuable partner in. Um, you mentioned 5G, 6G. There's a security aspect to that, which uh, many of our partners around the world, especially here in Europe, they were unaware of. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so uh, the, the Huawei uh, digital backbone that was cheap and efficient and, uh, you know, readily installed by happy people, um, you know, we, we had to, that was a global irritant <laughs> between right. the United States. And it's sort of, it was sort of like we were the guys delivering the bad news. And, and a lot of people felt that we sort of invented the problem, but people have woken up to that. So there, there's great potential in the relationship. Um, and I think that um, there's not enough relate, uh, recognition of the um, risk and the, uh, um, that a less uh, agile, uh, Joe Biden made serious sacrifices for this trip and he didn't come back with a lot of instantly tangible deliverables. Um, so he took a risk. Uh, a man who's regarded primarily as a retail politician took a, a great risk to restore American interests uh, at personal expense. I, I think that's close to an operational definition of statesmanship, which is not a word I've ever used in the same sentence before with Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> I, beautiful. We need to cut it there. That's awesome. Okay. David, I'm going to ask you one. I'm going to ask you one more question, if that's Okay. Sure. Yeah, um, we, haven't, we haven't discussed golf yet. Yeah, yeah. We haven't discussed, okay, I didn't say. It, I, I, didn't say I was it. that close. I was, I <laughs> <laughs> David, you are one of the great follows on Twitter for understanding the Russia Russia Ukraine invasion um, and the situation there, and it has been that way for about four or five months now. What I mean, some uh, were thinking before Biden actually visited Israel and Saudi Arabia, this trip was going to be mostly about Russia, trying in in various mm -hmm. different ways to get something to you know, counteract Russia and the great power game and using these middle powers in the Middle East. And then you have um, Vladimir Putin going to Iran and Turkey this week. Did mm -hmm. um, do you do you think and it's impossible to know because it wasn't in the White House fact sheet, but did they discuss Russia, do you think? And do you think um, was there any movement there? I mean, do you can you shed any light on how how Biden and his team may have approached that situation in those talks with Russia with uh, excuse me, with Saudi Arabia, if that happened? Uh, well, I can give, I can give you speculation, <laughs> which is great. So, yeah. Podcast, so, uh, so, yeah, so this is, so it's worth exactly what you're paying for it. Um, 
uh, Israel is the only apparent negotiator with Russia that we can reach out to that we trust. You know, Israel um, has good relations with Russia uh, and they've managed to, you know, work out a, a informal memorandum uh, or way of doing business in Syria where, you know, they attack everybody in Syria except for the Russians. I mean, there's a real level of coordination there given the uh, Russian origin of a significant amount of the population of Israel. So I think that there was a lot of discussion there. I think that um, on the um, rant, on the uh, Saudi side, I think that the discussion probably shifted a little more towards um, an examination of the changed nature of warfare and the fact that what we're seeing is a Russia which had, because of its operations in Syria, been seen as more nimble, more flexible, more modernized, but now is uh, being shown to be basically the, the, the Red Army of 1945 with, you know, with longer range standoff weapons. Um, <laughs> so, so that, I think that any objective military analyst uh, is... You know, I was shocked by the poor performance of the Russian forces. So, so they have kind of declined as the option. Um, uh, they, their ability to say, well, we're going to go with the Russians if you don't support so that, that, that has been neutered. At the same time, as we know, you know, Russia views its decisive uh, weapon as energy. And, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is a swing oil producer. We've spoken about how natural gas is what's really needed. But, um, you know, energy is, is energy. And uh, we're looking at a, a winter where I think every little bit will matter. And I think that um, Saudi Arabia will be expected not only to provide the every little bit, but also uh, I think that there probably was a request. And I think there's a good chance that there was an agreement that um, there are going to be actions which will harm the revenue generating capacity of Russian oil exports. Colonel David Day Roche, professor at National Defense University, security expert, and joining us from a very warm room in a scorching hot London. Thank you so much, David. This is a great discussion. We appreciate it. It's always an honor, gentlemen. Thank you.